The format's going to be very simple. Uh, I'm going to introduce the people, then Wendy takes over. <laughs> so there you go. We, first, we have Marka Bristow, President and CEO of Access Living in Metropolitan Chicago. Uh, many, give her a round of applause to begin with. I'll just read the first two lines because all of it is heavy hitting. Marka is nationally and internationally distinguished leader in the disability rights movement. As president and chief executive officer of Access Living in Metro Chicago, Bristow is the leader of one of the nation's foremost disability rights organizations. Give her a round of applause, Marka. Next to her is Wendy Dubow, President and CEO, United Way of Metropolitan Chicago, and soon to be your moderator. Round of applause. <laughs> Wendy serves as the President and Chief Executive Officer of United Way, Metropolitan Chicago, the largest private funder of health and human services in the greater Chicago region. Round of applause right there. That's pretty impressive. Finally, we have Rick Estrada, President and CEO, Metropolitan Family Services. Give him another round of applause. You're not running for anything, are you? Uh, should. Uh, <laughs> during his tenure at MFS, Estrada has led the expansion of the agency's reach by 25,000, currently totaling 68,000, and oversees the growth of the agency's budget from 32 million to 50 million. Round of applause for Rick. <laughs> Wendy, okay. take it away. Thank you, Jay. Paul. <laughs> Did Jay Doherty, even when he's not here. <laughs> Sister Rosemary, you saw that. Thank Paul. you, Paul. Paul. Yes, thank you. <sighs> thank you all, welcome. I'm thrilled to see a packed room, and on behalf of my esteemed colleagues and partners and great leaders, welcome here today. Um, I suspect you are all extremely interested in the topic of the future of social services in our state. It's a critical moment, as you know, nine months into the fiscal year without a budget, and we are thrilled to share perspective on this really important topic. Um, I'm going to get us started and turn it over to Rick and to Marka, and what I'm going to try to do actually is set the stage. Um, so a little bit of background here. United Way is the largest non-governmental funder of human services locally across the state and nationally. We are also nonpartisan, so it's a great opportunity for me to share perspective um, above the fray and uh, from the point of view of what we see. So as a backdrop, we, United Way, raise $57 million a year and we fund very high quality interventions in income, education, health, and the safety net through outstanding agency partners like Metropolitan Family Services, Access Living, and many other partners that are in the room today. So we have a, a very wide view of what's going on. And I would like to share that view with all of you so you have all the information and then we can get into a very good discussion about what's going on in human services. Um, we have been conducting longitudinal research, and I want to start out by sharing some survey results, which you actually have at your, at your table place. So since the last spring, we have been um, conducting surveys across the state with United Way funded partners. And what we have learned is pretty startling about the condition of the state of the human services sector and what it means for people. And that's why we're here today, is to talk about that and share the impact of all of that. So I'm gonna start by saying that over half of our funded agencies, United Way agencies, which are generally very, very strong, very high quality agencies, are materially funded by the state in their, their operating budget. That means over 20% or more of their budgets are funded by the state of Illinois. Um, so though we are a significant private funder, most of their funding is reliant upon the state's budget. 85% of the agencies that we've surveyed since the last spring are now cutting services to people and cutting programs. So that's longitudinal research. We've done three surveys. The latest was in January, and those are some of the results that you see at your place. 85% of our partners have been cutting services to people and to programs. Half of the agencies that we fund are now drawing down their reserves. So a lot of financial instability in the sector. 
and about a quarter of them have been reporting to us that if there was no state budget that was put together by March, so here we are at the end of March, they would struggle to maintain existing operations. So this is pretty scary. It's pretty um, much of what we would call a tipping point in terms of the resources in the sector. What is also worth sharing as we look at this is some of the services that are, that are severely impacted, and you see that in the survey results that we shared, are, are not the kind of services you might think would be cut. So um, very formative services like job training, youth development services, mental health services, we present a variety of those for you to take a look at in the survey. Um, these are services that are not just important for people and the state of our civil society, they're important for the growth of our economy and the future of the state of Illinois. So it's a people and it's a future picture. There are also services that are very concerning um, to be cut if you look at what we call return on investment. So where we spend money, the kind of results that we see, the kind of returns on that investment for people and future growth. And so you look at some of what we've shared where the cuts are, are happening, where we're concerned that um, the state and therefore all the residents in the state will be paying more for what we have to do later on when we don't fund preventative services like job training, like youth development, like mental health services, many other services are listed. Um, you know, I, I'm putting out the big picture. United Way's role is to share that that picture, and you know, we've got a lot of statistics. But you know, beyond the statistics, I want to share a couple of stories, um, and then my colleagues are going to share more stories. Um, you know, you, we work with so many partners, we talk to so many partners, we're hearing stories of rape crisis counseling centers um, now having 12, month, 12 week long intake wait lists or um, partners of ours that are serving you know, meals on wheels kinds of programs to the elderly, cutting back on that so that elderly are no longer getting um, regular meals delivered where they are not able to actually um, get them on their own. Um, I will tell a personal story of United Way to bring it right home to us. We um, have been looking to hire somebody in the financial area of our team and found a great candidate actually from out of state, made an offer. She wanted to accept it and in the end couldn't because she said her kids were reliant on some of the service, school-based services, um, special needs services for two of her kids and she could not... Um, move from Washington, D.C. to the state of Illinois because that picture was too insecure. So we lost that talent um, and are concerned about what it means for attracting talent to our state. We've been sharing this picture with government leaders from all sides of the aisle. So the information that you see there in the survey, we've conducted briefings, we've been down in Springfield, we've been publishing the results. We don't see any resolution in sight. It's part of the reason we're here today communicating this. Um, a couple of other things. I, I hear a lot in my role, a couple of things I just want to kind of share my perspective on. I hear a lot in my role about, well, you know, limited resources in the state, which is true. We've got some structural issues in our fiscal house. They do need to be fixed. We need to turn the corner on those issues to make sure there's sustainable long-term funding for human services and, and other areas that are so critical for the state. I hear a lot about this should be a great opportunity for restructuring, and this can be a chance for efficiencies to be garnered in the nonprofit sector. And I want to say a couple things to that. You know, every sector could could benefit from more efficiency, but. I don't see that happening right now. I think it's a very, very difficult conditions and environment for real positive restructuring to occur. It's not the kind of um, environment that allows for very thoughtful planning about how to secure the first future by putting together service sets and, and people reached, et cetera. Instead, what I see is a lot of nonprofit leaders that are not able to actually merge with other partners because they're afraid of taking on debt that's not sustainable, or um, what they're being forced to do, which anybody would do, and their boards are, are requiring them to do, is just cut back their budget, cut back their staff, cut back their programs, which really means less services for at-risk populations. I see a lot of our agency partners struggling um, not to take the money out of service, but in the end, and our research shows it, 
it comes out of what, what people at risk really need. So my concern actually is that in this environment we will go forward with a lot of different organizations that are all very strapped and it's very difficult for them to reach people in need of human services. One other thing I will say is, um, you know, oftentimes I hear folks say, well, private philanthropy should, should step in and, um, and fill that gap. So what I can tell you is we are the largest non-governmental funder of human services and it will be impossible for us to do that. All of, all of private philanthropy in our state contributes a few percentage points in the 100% mix of human services funding. So the math doesn't work for private philanthropy to be able to fill in the gap um, of the magnitude that we're talking about. And just to close so I can turn it over to Rick and then to Marka, what we're talking about, for example, right now in this fiscal year where we still don't have a budget, there were 825 human services agencies that were contracted to deliver more up, upwards of 400 million, that's a pretty rough estimate, but it's a very conservative estimate, of services in this year. So they've been struggling to do that, and the services have not been paid, contracted, but not paid. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rick, and then I'll come back in at the end. Yeah, uh, Wendy, thank you so much to say, and I have eight minutes, so I'm gonna time myself so you don't have to. Um, so as you heard, my name is Rick Estrada. I'm president of Metropolitan Family Services. It's the first chartered not-for-profit organization in the state of Illinois. So to give you a little sense of perspective, that was uh, in 1857. To give you um, a more perspective on that is there's another great institution that's hurt by this state budget impasse, the University of Illinois, represented by Chancellor uh, Michael Armaritas from UIC over there. They, are, uh, they were founded in 1867, so 10 years before the great University of Illinois, we were founded and started serving people. Um, in addition to that, just more perspective, after the big fire in 1871, we are the organization that was charged to buy the lumber and wood and help rebuild much of the housing that poor folks used uh, during that time. Some of that housing is still today. But I'll get uh, to the point of my speech here. Uh, today we serve uh, 68,000 people in 54 communities in Chicago, Suburban, Cook, and DuPage County. Last year our budget was just over 50 million. We have nearly 900 staff colleagues, 933 volunteers working hard in communities that need us in neighborhoods like Roseland, Inglewood, Belmont, Cragen, suburbs like Blue Island, Addison, and Skokie, your neighbors, people like you. We offer many of the services now in crisis, including mental health, early learning, domestic violence, help for seniors, and when we do don't offer the services, we find those services for our clients. Based on the demand, our business is way up. Yet it's still a tough economy and uh, with years of cuts have forced many of our peers out of business. We've tried to fill that gap. We've expanded by 60% over the last five years. Uh, but today the threat really is one about instability and lack of leadership. Nine months into the fiscal year, the state still does not have a budget and it could only be considered a destructive failure. It is damaging our economy, it is hurting thousands of people, and it's wrecking havoc on organizations like Metropolitan Family Services. I'll tell you a little bit more about the sector. Uh, we are a critical part of the Illinois business sector, so organizations like us are major contributors. So just a couple of facts here. Uh, Illinois non-for-profits employ 517,600 employees who earned $24.5 in wages in 2012. That's 10% of the private sector workforce. We generated $459 million in state income taxes, so we are a formidable part of, of, of this state's economy. We are economic drivers in low-income communities. Our staff spend locally, support their families, pay taxes. We also hire some of our clients. For them, we are a gateway to the middle class. The state uh, outsources to nonprofits because we provide great results and offer great value. We increase this by raising private dollars because as you know, uh, the state contracts do not pay for the full cost of services. I'll give you just a couple of examples of why we are a good choice to fund. Quality early childhood programs allow parents to go to work. They help children do better, both in school and when they become adults. Research shows that for every dollar you invest in early childhood, you get 
uh, $7 back on return on that investment. And that's conservative research. Uh, similarly, it costs a fraction for us to take care of mentally ill uh, people in communities compared to state institutions, ER rooms, or the criminal justice systems. And we certainly provide much better results. Unfortunately, both of these programs have been deeply destabilized by our state budget crisis, and the problem is getting worse. When the state doesn't pay its bills, it's vulnerable people and the people who care for them that hurt the most. Uh, let me just uh, paint a quick picture uh, with the situation in Metropolitan. We earn, and I do mean earn, 35% of our revenue from the state. But the state treats us like an unwilling, uh, like an unwilling lender. So we are essentially subsidizing our state through our lines of credit and through our reserves, as Wendy said earlier. Uh, but not only do they treat us that way, they also do not pay some of their bills. And so bills, for example, that would pay for mental health service and psychiatric care. They, they, we had a, a half a million dollar grant there that was completely eliminated by that. And so you could imagine what that means uh, for our patients. Uh, payment issues are only a part of it, again, uh, because mental health is built on a medical foundation. The entire practice is at risk, and let me, let me tell you how. So, if we see a mentally ill patient has to see a doctor. If the doctor isn't there because the state cut the funding, then he can't provide, he can't diagnose the doctor, he can't uh, provide medication. So our social workers then can't provide the resources and therapy that they need. For us, that's 10,000 people that will be impacted by that half a million dollar decision by the state of Illinois. We are now, so we are now out of options. Uh, by the end of June, Illinois uh, will be passed due on $2.4 million for four of our programs alone. We have contracts, but we not, we've not seen a dime. Could your business operate in that way? Well, mine no longer can. Last Thursday, our board accepted my extremely painful recommendation that we no longer accept contracts for programs that have not been paid by the state. So by June 30th, let me tell you what's going to happen. 16 mentally ill people in two group homes that we call Silas uh, could no longer live there. They will lose their clinicians who care for them. They will lose uh, the ability to work and live in their own community, and they will lose their homes. 140 people, 140 families in our healthy family programs will lose the child visitation service. It's a nationally renowned program that will help children stay on track in school and in life. They will lose those services. They, even though we have a great fan of the program in First Lady Diana Rahner, we've not seen a dime. Children who have been traumatized, abused uh, in many different ways in our program called a Safe from the Start will lose that counseling service uh, by uh, the 30th. Young people who are incarcerated or a step away from being in prison will also lose that program uh, come the end of the fiscal year. So, Human lives matter, right? Uh, we, in my job, we don't, we don't get to cut an assembly line. But when the state cuts our programs, it means lives. Our communities will also lose 38 middle class jobs because if we don't have those programs, we have to lay people off. And these are people that are highly trained and are difficult to bring back to the organization. They have training, a licensed clinical social worker made a master's degree, has training equivalent to an MBA, and yet they make a whole lot less, about $48,000 a year on average with us. And we are considered one of the strong organizations. We're the first one chartered in the state of Illinois, one of the strongest ones in the state. And this is happening to us. We know it's happening across the state of, state of Illinois, multiplied uh, by hundreds, so we are talking about hundreds of thousands of people that will be impacted. Um, so what, I'm gonna, the last thing I'll say is I want to paint a picture of what it means to just one individual. It's a woman that we work with, her name is Angela Love. She's a recent client in our Southeast Center. Uh, this is her real name because Angela has had the tremendous courage to allow us to use her story. Angela came to us, her life was in danger. She had um, survived the rape attempt, the home invasion, the death of an unborn child. She had major depression, post-traumatic stress disorder. And most days she was too ill to get out of bed, but she found the strength to come to Metropolitan Family Services. She saw her doctor, uh, Dr. Gibbons, a person who was no longer find, funded by the state, it will soon not be able to provide the services, diagnosed her severe illness, had the rapport to convince her to take her medication because she wanted to, and that decision saved her life. 
Angela worked hard. She got help. She got better. You know, people do get better. This works. Today, she helps in her community, uh, helps others in her community face similar challenges. She's off the medication, has a voice, has a job, and has testified at the General Assembly at events and, our, and in our annual report. So Angela's not the problem. Angela's a gift. Rich or poor, urban or suburban, regardless of color, creed, or class, mental illness is a reality. Even if you have resources, it's a major challenge. So I ask you, who is your Angela? If your Angela is low income, it's very likely that she lost her psychiatrist already. If your Angela is not on Medicaid, it's, it's, it's very likely that she will not get better uh, in this state. And I do mean in this state of Illinois. So, you know, I can't express the urgency enough to you all that we, we need to do everything we can to make our leadership in the state understand that we need to find a budget solution. So, Wendy, I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Turn it over to Marka. Thank you all for being here today. I'm interested to see in the audience how many of you are here representing the human service sector. Could you raise your hand? Okay. Another question. How many of the people in this room have in your life or in your family's lives turned to some agency for some kind of help? Could you raise your hands? Look around the room. It's you that we're here for today. It's not some other people. It's all of us that are here today. I wish I could say that I am happy to be here, but I'm not. I've been at the helm of Access Living for 36 years now since its founding, and I've never seen the disability service system and the human service system in such a crisis, teetering on collapse. Access Living is one of 22 centers for independent living around the state. We serve thousands of people with disabilities with services to support their independence, as well as advocacy and pu public policy change. We have led all the major reform over the years. The Americans with Disabilities Act, lifts on buses, technology to support people, accessible housing, and uh, programs to get people out of costly institutions. Right now, four of my sister centers are planning to close if there is no budget by the end of this year. Already, 39, centers, 39 individuals throughout the state have lost their jobs. 95 of the uh, staff in the centers are furloughed or taking pay cuts and working only four days a week. I'm reminded of the good old movie Network. We're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. I say this with fear, sadness, and a lot of anger, as so much of what we've worked for and fought for for the last 35 years is really up for grabs. Tying people's lives to a turnaround agenda has dug us deeper into a fiscal hole, and the only thing it's turned around is the lives of people who can least afford it. People like my friend Larry Biondi, who has significant cerebral palsy, he's nonverbal, and has worked for 23 years at the Progress Center for Independent Living, teaching people how to live independently through peer support and self-advocacy. Larry helped the state develop the first pilot program to transition people out of nursing homes through which we have saved the state millions of dollars. Larry lost his job last week because the state hasn't paid its contract. What will happen to him? After his unemployment runs out, he'll probably go on SSDI. Or Sarone Brown and Daryl Stanford. Sarone uses a wheelchair and is nonverbal, lives with her 74 two-year-old mother, and Daryl is the home health aide that supports the family. Since the state has been about without a budget for 231 days, his agency has not been paid. Therefore, he has not been paid his $10 an hour paycheck. He stays with the family because he cares about them, but other health care providers cannot do that and home health agencies around the state are closing their doors. Or Sandra, 
who's a client in our nursing home deflection program at Access Living, set up to prevent people from going into institutions or to prevent homelessness. The state's assistive technology funding has been frozen, so we can't provide the home modifications needed. He will probably end up in a nursing home. All over the state, disability services are feeling the same thing. Autism support programs closed. Specialized dental clinics for people with developmental disabilities closed. Respite services cut. Assistive technology programs cut. Meals on Wheels for Seniors slashed. HIV prevention programs cut. A thousand mental health and substance abuse clinics staff laid off or re reduced hours. And home services changes being made to individuals, cutting hours of necessary home care, even though their medical condition has not changed. So many of these changes make no fiscal sense. For example, the state has determined that they're not going to ch close any of the state-operated developmental uh, centers. We still have se seven in this state, costing about 190000 per person per year, even while home and community-based service programs are closing, reducing staff, because we don't pay them enough in fees to maintain what it costs to get people out of those institutions. Last year, the governor proposed slashing 34,000 seniors and people with disabilities from the home services and community care programs. We organized and fought back, and thanks to our collaboration with the state legislature, we were able to get the governor to back off. However, now they're back with a new effort to reduce $200 million from the senior home care program. It just, they, you push here and it pops up over there. These caregiver programs not only save money, they add to our economy. In fiscal year 2013, 144,000 caregiver, caregiver jobs brought $1.4 billion in federal money into the state. It also saved us a billion dollars a year and for every dollar of general revenue funds that were spent, it generated $3.74 in economic activity. And remember, these workers pay taxes. Agency heads like myself and Rick's and those of you in this room, we are under such severe stress. No end in sight, no discussion about how to repay us, no solutions. My own organization has done everything to build ourselves as a fiscally responsible organization. We follow best practice. We had prudent operating reserves six months. We have strong fundraising and diversified uh, revenue streams. 50% of our money comes from the private sector. However, in several of the state programs, the state stopped paying back in September they owe us $60,000 a month. We've tightened our belt, frozen travel, frozen positions, reduced our health care costs by $200,000, and reduced some positions. And even with all that, at the end of the year, we will be owed $720,000 on our $5 million a year budget. We are depleting our reserves those that has taken us 35 years to build. Now we face a, the uh, possibility of going another year without a budget. Answer the question, what will happen when Washington wakes up and realizes that all the state matching dollars that the state is supposed to put up to bring in 80% of federal money didn't come in this year? Imagine all the programs, all the federal dollars that we will lose next year if we don't turn this around. If we think this is a crisis, wait till that occurs. We need your help to survive this. We cannot do this alone. 
I want to thank so many of you here who've already spoken out, who've been to rallies, written to legislators, had meetings with government officials, testified. But those of you who have not, especially corporate and civic leaders, we need you to do so. We need you to call and write the governor, call all of your friends and have them do the same. We need op-eds. We need you to show up at rallies. We need to reclaim Illinois. The lives of so many people are in a balance. And you know, as your hands showed me earlier, you'll never know when your own family will need us. Last week, Senator Kirk made a remark regarding the Supreme Court process. He turned to his colleagues and he said, it's time for them to man up. Well, I want to say to the governor, it's time for you to man up and to understand that governance and leadership involve compromise and working together with our community. We didn't get in this place easily. We're not going to get out of it easily. And finger pointing does no good for the people we've talked about here today. Thank you. So we want to turn it over to your questions, but I'm going to just um, sort of draw together a couple threads before we do that. And then please, we, we do want to discuss the questions with you. So, um, you know, wh why are we doing this? We actually spent a lot of time, Rick, Mark, uh, and I, and all of our talented teams to, to put this together. And we're, we're here today and we're doing this for you. We're doing this, as Marka said, because we hope that through all of this, you know, you came, clearly you came with interest today, and hopefully you've heard more, you've seen some, some survey data, and learn more about what's going on. It's really important that all of you continue to stay informed and you use your voice, right? We all have voices. And you can see that's what we're trying to do today is use our voice, not only with local legislative leaders, that's key, right? But really with anybody who um, has influence. I think that's really important, right? Because at the end of the day, what's swinging in the balance here is the kind of future that we want for our state and I think essentially the future of civil services, civil society in the state of Illinois. And so our, our panel is entitled The Future of, of Social Services in the State. And I think we are here today to impress upon all of you the gravity of what's going on, to inform you and to, to motivate everybody to take action because we don't wanna rob ourselves of that future of the state of human services in the state of Illinois. So that is how I'm gonna close, yep. Okay, so this is from Karen Wrighton from the Public Health Institute of Metropolitan Chicago. We've been advised to go to the Court of Claims in July to recoup funds. Do you think that is a viable option? So, <laughs> Rick, I might ask you to actually comment on that. I, I will say, um, Rick and I were down, I'm gonna share a little story here. Rick and I were together in Springfield sharing what we just shared with all of you with um, some government partners. And that was some advice that we actually got back um, that that would be how we should respond. And I, I will say honestly, I kind of raised my hand and said, I don't think that addresses the whole picture, but I'm gonna turn it over to Rick because I know you've looked at this and have some perspective. There are uh, multiple or and organized groups across the state of Illinois of nonprofit leaders that are thinking about that um, litigation, uh, not just the court of claims, but litigation in general. And that is one of the pieces of advice that we received in Springfield from most ironically, a uh, chief of staff of one of the leaders out there that when we asked the question about when might we expect uh, some uh, revenue coming our way, the person said, uh, have, you, have you ever considered litigation? And we, we didn't want to let them off that easy by saying, oh yeah, we were thinking about that. We said, well, uh, we've considered that, but really we want you to think about a real solution here and tell us whether your leader is working and in dialogue with the other leaders to bring a solution, and he uh, he simply said, they're not as, they're not speaking as much as you think they would be. Uh, so it was a depressing moment for us. But yes, yeah, certainly we're thinking about the litigation option and court of claims. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, this is from Anne Marie Saint Germain, who's a City Club board member. To all of us, you've spoken to the devastating impact on people's lives. How do we collectively change attitudes and political priorities? Please be as specific as possible about the action. I'm going to start with Marka. Um, last summer, I had the opportunity to host President Bill Clinton at the Access Living Gala, and um, through a pretty remarkable Clinton-esque um, stream of consciousness, he told stories of people with disabilities that he had met throughout his life. And um, I'll save you the details, but the, the end of his speech was, you've got to tell the stories. So I think those of you who are in the field, you need to mine your organization and find the real people whose stories you can tell. I would love nothing more than uh, one of our uh, major journalistic outlets in town, or more than one, to run a series um, like they have on many other big issues that ran day after day after day that told this story. Um, and, and then also, um, whenever the next massive action occurs, I think we need more people that look like all of you <laughs> to be there. Um, the activists are there, the uh, students are there, some of the labor unions are there, but everyday uh, Illinoisans who people perceive aren't being touched by this haven't been there as much as I would like to see. Rick, I don't know if you want to jump in. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll go quickly. Uh, um, uh, Anne-Marie, there's a group of uh, foundations that are funding, uh, they're, they're currently in the process already of putting together a message platform around this because we have a lot of stories out there in all the uh, um, digital and print media, but it seems like it's not resonating with the public yet. And so there's a, an attempt to get that message out there. But uh, I think to the second part of your question, and maybe I'm making this up as the second part of your question, but I don't think, think things will change until the business and civic community go to the leaders in Springfield and say, we've had enough. Because uh, the first thing that you need to do as a leader, whether it's at a nonprofit organization or the state of Illinois, is to inspire confidence in the people that you are trying to lead. And in this state, uh, I don't think there is the confidence that our leadership are going to get us to that next level. And if you believe in kind of growth economics, well, that works the same way. If you want this uh, state to grow its business, the business community has to have the confidence that their investments are going to matter, that they're going to trickle down into education and all the other areas. So first thing we need to do is, is make sure that we hold those leaders accountable because there certainly is no confidence in them. The other two things that I think would help is uh, once a seniors get involved, because seniors vote, once senior citizens get involved and understand that it impacts them personally and their children and their grandchildren, there's a possibility of change. The la last part is, once the college students come out uh, and, uh, and then realize that their MAP grants aren't going to be funded and they realize this is a real impediment for uh, matriculating into school next year, if you get seniors and college students out on the street and they look, guess what? They look just like all the rest of us. Then you realize, oh, it's, it's my neighbors. It's not just those people, it's my neighbors. Once we get those people out and activated, then things start changing. Yeah, so I'm just gonna add just something to that. Um, and uh, this may not be as specific, but it, it, I think it adds some perspective long-term. Ultimately, we need to decide what, we as people need to decide what the priorities in our state are. And we've got to be clear about what that is. This is carving the space for public awareness, right? It's part of what we're doing today. And it's about organizations coming together and generating public awareness campaigns, right? Of here's the situation that we find ourselves in fiscally and what it means for people. And what do we care about in terms of our priorities for public service, for people in public service? And then enlightening our leaders to make sure that they are governing according to those priorities. I know that's the long game, but that really is what this is about in the end, is making sure that people know what they want from government, and then they are working with government and government leaders to make sure that in the long term that's, 
that's where we go. So I, I would say a piece of this is absolutely public awareness for the long term. That's why we're doing this today. When, Wendy, if I could, yeah. since Anne Marie brought the question up, another thing that I think would help many of us for, I know there's quite a few public affairs people in this room, pro bono help in getting our message out either through our big coalitions, and there are many of them, or with the organization that you care about. Um, that's something that's first to get cut. <laughs> and number two, I think we've seen that a lot of the uh, reserves have been depleted. Lines of credit are being exhausted. Those of you who are from the banking world, um, these are your customers, <laughs> and they're, you can speak out as well in terms of the impact it's having on uh, the people you do business with. So that's actually a, a question that came through, a really great question that came through, so I'm glad you went there. And the question from Xavier Remy, University of Chicago, given the grim fiscal picture and moral imperative, what can the people of Chicago and leadership roles do personally and professionally to assist human service organizations until we have a budget? And so I think the pro bono piece, volunteering, is super helpful, of course giving support, giving financial support to, to all of these organizations. Rick, I'm gonna see if you have any thoughts and then I'll add in. Well, in addition to that, I would go back to what Marcus said earlier. We all are neighbors of elected officials. You know, they live in our communities. Certainly we have a whole table of elected officials that represent the different neighborhoods that Metropolitan Family Services serve sitting right in front of us. And we live with them, we go to school with them, implore them to, to end this crisis, to ask for a solution, implore them to continue to ask that work. I mean, they have to do their job differently than they have in the past. They have to stand up for, for us more and more. I think that that's the thing that is most critical. Yes, we, we have great pro bono support from attorneys and from um, you know, public relations firms and all of that. That's great, terrific. We want it, we still need it. But those people also live with our elected officials. Talk to them at, at service, at church, at synagogue, wherever it is. Get in front of them and say, this is enough. It's hurting our people, our neighbors. It, this is, and it's not just a moral imperative. This makes business sense to just end this. Yeah. So I would just add, I would kind of add on to all of those thoughts. I think um, our board and our fundraising cabinet and our corporate partners have been very supportive of what United Way is, is doing in terms of survey research, putting this word out. Um, organizing around this, and so I think to Rick, both Rick and Marcus' point, um, that is something, right? That kind of leadership to try to get the word out and try to um, be creative about what we can all do to make a difference is really important. Um, another question from Peggy Davis. Well, actually, we covered this. Um, question that came in wanting to understand the main cause of the funding gap for mental health services. Rick, I'm gonna give this to you. Wouldn't mental health services be covered by Medicaid and health insurance? Where are the gaps coming from? Uh, sure, um, so mental health services is covered by Medicaid and, and certain health insurance, but uh, it's, it's important for you to understand that the part that they cover is about 70% of the real cost to provide that service, right? So you, uh, they only pay for 70 cents on the dollar to provide that service. And the state in the past has provided these leadership grants for us to uh, subsidize the rest of that work so we could pay for psychiatrists. And again, it's a medical model. So if we don't have the psychiatrist, the rest of the model starts falling apart because we can't provide services with our licensed clinical social workers who are tremendous. Because, but what they do is they do case management, the therapy, make sure they're monitoring the medication. But if we don't have that critical first investment, the rest of it falls apart. And it doesn't matter if it's the uh, Medicaid or the, or the health insurance, they're just not paying the full cost. And so for us at Metropolitan, uh, there's, within the next six months, we need to make a decision whether this is an area where we can continue to provide services. And if we decide with the guidance of our board and our executive team that we need to get out of this business, that's 10,000 people that will lose their mental health services. And there simply is, there aren't enough other providers that will be willing to take on a losing business. Yeah, Mark is going to add. Yeah, um, we for years have supported something called Institutes for the Mentally Diseased, which are nursing homes uh, for people with mental illness. 
most people don't know that uh, there's no federal funding that supports that. That's 100% general revenue, even though, um, the, uh, even though it has been determined through a consent decree that people who are in those institutions have the right under the Americans with Disabilities Act to live in the community. So that's, a, that's an absolute slam dunk for each person that comes out and gets the community supports that Rick was just speaking about. We're saving enormous amounts of money because there's no federal Medicaid match that's in those institutions. But if the infrastructure falls apart, all that's going to happen is it's going to drive more and more people into those very institutions and the costs to the state are going to go through the roof. And just think of the, uh, I'm sorry, just think about the cost if, if those 10,000 people are no longer receiving their mental health care. You know, some of them are going to find alternatives and they're going to be okay. But, but out of those 10,000 people, let's just say, just imagine a number, uh, 3,000 don't. And they go into emergency rooms. They, they might end up back into the kind of the prison pipeline. And imagine what those costs are. You multiply that, uh, and it's just a bad investment. It's just a bad decision any way you look at it. Yeah. So one thing I just want to point out, actually, and um, Marka and, and Rick can't say this for themselves, but I can say this from where I sit. Um, you know, in this whole efficiency argument that I've heard, a lot of folks have said, right, well, this pressure on the system will um, have the very high performing agencies that get stronger and can merge other agencies into them. You can see what's going on here, extremely high performing agencies. It's not, in fact, I think in some, in some instances, they're suffering the brunt of it because they've been extremely successful in partnering with the state and getting the state funding, right? So you don't see this kind of survival of the fittest. You see, and Rick has actually said this before, you see that um, what's happening is survival of funding streams that have been mandated by court, not necessarily survival of funding streams that should be there or survival of funding streams to agencies who are performing extraordinarily well. Anyway, I can make that comment. I think and we have time I for... I just want to say, and um, both Access Living and Metropolitan, I think, have a strong fiscal track record. Uh, we've worked really hard on that. I also want to say, though, there's many incredibly wonderful organizations throughout the city of Chicago that um, don't have big donor bases supporting them that provide really important work in their communities. and. This is having the impact of survival of the fittest on many of those vital smaller organizations that are, you know, incredibly su important supports in the neighborhoods. Yeah. So one final question, and I think it's a, it's a good one to end on. It says, this is really to both of you, how are you keeping staff and board morale up enough to provide service? Well, that's a good question. I, I would say my organization is um, founded on civil rights, and therefore we know struggle for justice. And so for us, it's had a unifying effect, and I think it has enabled our staff morale, in spite of everything, to stay strong, perhaps more than some of the more uh, uh, agencies that only do social service who haven't been out um, in, in the struggle for human ju justice on the sidelines like we have. Um, but I will say right now, all of us are facing the kind of quandary that Rick described. We can make it through this fiscal year, um, but come July 1, I d have not yet made that very difficult recommendation to our board, but if I have to, we will be laying off about a quarter of our staff and, um, you know, 70% of the staff that work for us are people with disabilities. And I am doing everything in my power to avoid that. And the team as a whole, the way we've been dealing with it is through transparency. My staff know everything that I know, and we're not holding anything back from them. I, I would pick it up right from there. I, I agree that it's transparency and integrity in that transparency. Our, our staff... Um, during the first part of the fiscal year, we were, we were talking to them every two weeks, just making sure they were informed of what's going on. They knew what we knew. 
in, in some uh, instances, they had better information because they were closer to the ground or they had information from their elected officials. So whether it's the um, University of Illinois at Chicago or whether it's uh, the Cook County Hospital Health System with Jay here, um, their CEO, uh, it, it boils down to you want to have integrity and you want to have transparency. They have to trust you. Again, I, I said earlier, the main thing uh, uh, a leader is supposed to have is an, an ability to, to inspire confidence. This, this budget mess, it's uh, causing havoc because it's hard for us to inspire confidence when they read the newspaper. And they know that the Armageddon is coming, and, if, uh, and it's going to be June 30th. And June 30th, life for them is going to change. So that's more difficult. So what we have resorted to, which is something that is it's a cultural component for us, is as transparent as possible. OK. I think in the interest of that transparency, thank you all for being part of this discussion, for joining us. Thank you.